Ganz herzlich willkommen zur Media Convention 2017. Ich heiße Ursula Weidenfeld, bin Journalistin hier in Berlin und der Medienanstalt Berlin-Brandenburg als Gastgeberin der Veranstaltung der Media Convention als Medienrätin verbunden. Und ich darf Ihnen am Anfang nur so ein paar technische Ansagen machen, bevor Sie dann auch richtig und ordentlich begrüßt werden sollen. Wer twittern möchte, worüber wir uns sehr, 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 sehr freuen würden, tut dies bitte unter Hashtag MCB17. Wer entweder des Deutschen oder des Englischen nicht so mächtig ist, dass er denkt, er könnte all das, was wir hier sagen, den Tag über gut verfolgen, kann sich hinten an den Sprecherkabinen mit einem Stöpsel versorgen. Wir werden nämlich den Tag auf Deutsch und auf Englisch bestreiten. Anybody who is not able to follow everything we do in German could serve himself, herself with a translating machine, so everything could be understood and everything could be followed precisely. Wir werden heute über Medienpolitik reden, wie das gute, gute Tradition bei der Media Convention ist und Anja Zimmer, die Direktorin der MABB, der Medienanstalt Berlin-Brandenburg, wird Sie jetzt ordentlich und angemessen begrüßen. Frau Zimmer, Sie haben das Wort. Ja, hallo. Hallo von mir und herzlich willkommen. Ich freue mich, der Raum ist wieder voll. Super, klasse. Ich fange natürlich, wie sich das gehört, mit einem Dank an. Ich bedanke mich bei dem tollen Team der MABB, die dieses Event organisiert haben. Ich bedanke mich bei Alex Berlin, die es übertragen und bei dem MEZ in Babelsberg, was, am Ende, was morgen hier was gestalten wird auf der Bühne und mit Ideen beigetragen hat zum ganzen Event. Herzlichen Dank euch, das habt ihr alle toll gemacht. Und die verdienen einen kleinen Applaus, hey! So, ich will es nicht so lang machen. Ich möchte euch und Ihnen kurz erklären, was erwartet Sie heute hier auf Bühne 7 und gleich auch mal kurz auf Bühne 1. Frau Weidenfeld hat schon gesagt, unser Fokus liegt auf der Medienpolitik. Wir möchten mit Ihnen darüber sprechen, was, bewegt, was uns bewegt, was unser Aufgabengebiet ist. Umfasst. Die Medienanstalt Berlin-Brandenburg, die meisten werden es nicht wissen, ist zuständig dafür, dass sie Hörfunk, Fernseh und Internet reguliert. Und ähm, wir beschäftigen uns dadurch natürlich aus einer ganz anderen Perspektive damit, was machen wir eigentlich im Internet, wie muss eigentlich die digitale Welt, die digitale Gesellschaft aussehen. Wir möchten mit Ihnen laut über die Zukunft des Internets diskutieren, nachdenken und vielleicht auch streiten und gemeinsam nach Lösungen suchen. Wichtigstes Thema für uns ist immer und immer und immer, deshalb wiederhole ich das jedes Jahr, die Sicherung der Meinungsvielfalt. Und die ist bedroht wie nie durch internationale Player, die Zugang vermitteln und Einfluss nehmen. Durch sich verändernde, sich immer mehr verändernde Marktbedingungen, die die Finanzierung von Journalismus immer schwieriger machen. Oder durch Sachen wie Hate Speech, die uns einfach den Spaß daran nehmen, uns weiter im Internet zu bewegen. Was können wir dagegen tun? Ich glaube, wenn wir es nicht schaffen, die Medienvielfalt zu erhalten, dann wird das Konsequenzen für uns alle haben, für die Demokratie. Wir sehen das in Wahlen äh, allen Teilen auf der ganzen Welt. Es wird Konsequenzen für die Meinungsfreiheit haben, weil die nicht mehr funktioniert, wenn es keinen Spaß mehr macht, sie auszuüben. Und deshalb möchten wir mit Ihnen vor allem in den nächsten zwei Tagen über Themen sprechen, wie Glaubwürdigkeit im Journalismus, Stichwort Fake News, wie zeitgemäße Regulierung von Intermediären aussehen kann. Stichwort, was machen wir mit Plattformen wie Google, wie Facebook? Was machen wir mit Algorithmen? Wie beeinflussen die unsere Meinungsbildung? Und über ein Level Playing Field. Stichwort, was machen wir mit denen, die die ganzen Daten haben und damit arbeiten? Ich möchte Ihnen jetzt nicht das ganze Programm vorlesen. Ich glaube, das würde den Zeitrahmen etwas sprengen und Sie können es auch selbst nachschauen. Aber in den nächsten zwei Tagen ist unser Fokus hier klar auf der Medienpolitik. Am dritten Tag machen wir Workshops, kleinere Formate, wo wir das, was wir theoretisch hier besprochen haben, versuchen auch mal anzuwenden. Ich möchte heute einfach jetzt an dieser Stelle auf zwei Sachen hinweisen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Professor Frank Pasquale von der Universität aus Maryland bei uns ist. Warm welcome to you, Frank. Ich 
Er ist ein renommierter Forscher im Bereich der Algorithmen und wird gleich um 13.30 Uhr auf Stage 1 erzählen, wie, die automatisierte wie wir mit der automatisierten Öffentlichkeit umgehen und was die Medienregulierung, der Datenschutz, der Verbraucherschutz, das Kartellrecht, wie sie zusammenarbeiten können und müssen, um dem Problem Herr zu werden. Und jetzt würde ich gerne begrüßen die, das Team von ShareLab. Und nun wird es ein bisschen schwierig für mich. Ähm, ShareLab wird zur Eröffnung unseres Programms eine Präsentation halten. Und zwar Professor Fladan Jola und sein Kollege Gjordje Krivokapic. Ich hoffe, ich habe das jetzt richtig hinbekommen. Sie werden uns zeigen, wie der Prozess und die Datennutzung die Facebook hinter dem Newsfeed laufen lassen, wie das beeinflusst, was wir zu sehen bekommen. Sie werden das in einer visualisierten Präsentation machen, in einer Karte, wo Sie das sehr anschaulich darstellen. Ich habe das selber noch nicht gesehen, freue mich aber total. Und ja, ich würde sagen, herzlich willkommen to you, Sherlab, please. I would like to ask you, come here, just show us what happens. Und freue mich jetzt sehr, dass es losgeht. I think I never spoke in, in front of such a big audience. <laughs> okay. So, my name is Vladan. I'm coming from Serbia. And uh, basically, I'm uh, director of one organization that's called Share Foundation. But also, what I'm going to present now, it's one side group, side project of Share Foundation that started to have his own life. And it's called Share Lab. First, it started with the idea of visualizing and, and trying to understand different forms of invisible infrastructure that exist around us. And the biggest invisible infrastructure that there is, is internet. Okay, so we started with classical like network mapping and produced some kind of beautiful maps that we didn't know what to do with them. But then, in the moment when in Serbia they wanted to introduce uh, internet filtering, we found some good use of those maps. So we were able to understand how those networks look like. And then we started to do a lot of different other investigations. And we started to think about ourselves as we are some kind of detectives, but not researching or investigative journalists, but not researching people, we start to research mostly machines and, and, and processes. So this is some other research that we did that was uh, uh, visualizing the trackers or third party content that is embedded in, in websites that we are visiting. Then we had like one research related to, to, to uh, retention of metadata in Serbia. So also mapping different like Serbian secret service and other shady organization, how they're accessing our metadata. Then after that, things started to be more serious, and we, we, we were investigating uh, one group that, is, that was called, is still called Hacking Team. So we were able to track them based on their metadata from their emails. So we were trying to do something that is basically like what NSA is doing to us. We start to, to use the same methodology. So we read the, the Snowden revelations. And then we started to, to use the same methodology, but tracking uh, bad guys, like tracking uh, um, hacking team. And then we were investigating, for example, uh, how, the, for example, trying to investigate in Serbian media different forms, different anomalies, for example, trolls political party trolls. So this visualization represents the comments, the same comments in media. So because in Serbia, we have uh, uh, trolls who are like basically spamming and, and flooding the, the, the comments of, of, of uh, news websites with, uh, with some kind of political context. So we were trying to spot them. But one of our biggest research, and this is the main topic for today, uh, 
we try to, to, to go inside of this black box that is called Facebook. So, and this research was, is called Inside Facebook Algorithmic Factory. So let's start with some numbers. Okay. So 1.6 billion active users in 2015. Now they are saying there is almost 2, 2 billion people. So this is like, if Facebook is a country, it will be bigger than China. So 1 billion log into Facebook every day, 300 petabytes of user data, 1.1 trillion likes since 2004. 4.5 billion likes every day, 3.1 million likes per minute, 17 billion location tag posts every day, 350 million uploaded photos every day, 4.7 billion items shared each day, and 10 billion messages sent each day. Some big numbers. Okay? And then on the other side, so we have this on one side, on the other side we have 17.9 billion revenue in 2015. So what we were interested in is to trying to understand how all of those numbers that we saw a few seconds before is transformed now into 17.9. So, since 2000 early, there are some really interesting theories about like uh, immaterial work, how basically all of us we are we are when we are on Facebook. What we are we are basically working for Facebook when we are uploading something, uh, when we are tagging people, when we are commenting, we are basically working for Facebook. So we are following this idea of of uh, immaterial work, and uh, so if there is one billion people and they spend like 20 minutes per day liking, commenting, and, and scrolling through. This, there is basically 300 million free working hours per day that we are giving to Facebook. Okay. And so there is a like, lot of different ways to approach this problem of mapping of this process. So, so one, for example, can be like mapping of the human layer of Facebook. And this is, uh, for example, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the board of director, the first level of executives, how they are connected between each other, how they are, they are where did they study? So it, we can try to understand this human layer of that. Or for example, to understand the network around Peter Thiel or Mark Anderson. Or we can try to visualize and try to understand the also human aspect like labor, this is, for example, visualization of 1,000 LinkedIn profiles of Facebook employees that we did. So we try to understand how they are becoming part of the Facebook. But, but this is just the, the human layer of the story. What we are interested in here, it's algorithmic layer. So what's going on? Because this human layer, it's mostly visible you know, on LinkedIn accounts, on like you know, like shiny offices and so on and so on. But what is within this box, it's, it's really not visible on the level of, of uh, algorithms, on the level of how this really works. So what we start to do here on the left side of this map, this is the map of how our behavior is it, transformed into the product. It's really complex map, but OK, it's a map. And so what we did, we tried to map all the inputs, so the, the fields where we interact with Facebook. And on the right side, we mapped the, the, the output that basically it's a profile that is being sold. And then we try to understand how those two things relate to each other. And so we map, for example, like, share, search, update status, how you are adding photos, friends, so on. We, another set of information that we are giving to, to Facebook, it's a profile information, so what we think about ourselves. Name, surname, so on, so on. The third big uh, uh, group of information they're collecting, it's through our devices, so basically what our devices are, are saying about us. 
And here we have a visualization of uh, uh, all the permissions that we are giving to Facebook through different apps. So they can, for example, read phone status, view Wi-Fi connection, record audio, take pictures, modify, delete. And all of those information can potentially become part of, of, of this number of information that they are collecting about us. This is, for example, a map of, of uh, different cookies. So each time we visit some website, in 90% in of the time, we are stepping on some little Google uh, uh, cookie in, in almost 50% of the time the Facebook cookie. So that means that even we don't use Facebook, we don't use Google, I don't know how, but somehow, we, uh, we are giving in 50% of the time, giving information of, about our movements. And then there is one big part of thing. It's, it's uh, other companies that Facebook owns. This is different acquisitions by Facebook. Or something that they called Facebook partners. It's another data dealers or marketing agents that, that they like exchange the, the, the information with. So all of those are inputs into the system. On the other side, on the output, is ba basically us transformed in, into profiles. So based on age, location, so for example, they are able to sell uh, uh, us as a profile with the ethnic affinity. They say ethnic affinity, not like direct, yeah? Based on life events, what we do, how we do. Our political affiliation, like are we going to uh, engage in politics as a conservative, liberal, or, or something else? So different forms of, of tags that they are attaching to us. How we are traveling, so on, so on. And then, so on one side we have input, on the other side we have output, but what is in the, in, in the middle? So how we research all of this, it's really hard to, to make quantitative methods to, to understand what's going on there, but what we found, it's around like seven to 8,000 publicly available patents that are explaining some pieces of the puzzle. So we, we search all of those patents, we're trying to extract different information and then try to make one big picture. So basically all of our information is going through action store, being collected with something, uh, sorry, with something that it's called uh, action logger. Then there is something called the uh, content store, edge store, and all of this together is forming something that is called social graph. And social graph, it's the heart of, of Facebook uh, empire. It, it's where, for example, every time we upload one picture, this, this picture appears as a part of the social graph that is then connected to other uh, uh, users or, or, or other things. And this is how the, the, the data is basically stored in this algorithmic empire. Then we found like a lot of different uh, patents explaining how those things are, are then relating to each other. And I will not go deeply into details of each of those uh, uh, patents, but basically what they are trying to do, they are trying to understand each content that you are publishing or your behavior and trying to tag each content with some keywords and then trying to understand context of this, trying to understand topic and basically to do the same thing from another side. So they are combining ads with uh, 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 keywords and topics that are, they extracted uh, from your behavior or your content. And there is a lot of, lot of weird patents out there. So, for example, social data recording, system and methods for measuring user affinity in social network environment, systems and methods for social mapping, determining influence in a social networking system. So, there, 
So each of, of, of every behavior that you do, everything that you publish there, it's being analyzed on a lot of different levels. For, for, for example, uh, one way of analyzing what you do is through, through targeting based on a social connection. So they try to understand, for example, if you have uh, two friends, one at, three friends, for example, two are Democrat, one is Republican, who are you? Are you Democrat and Republican? Then trying to understand, basically, in some fuzzy logic, where do you belong? And then mixing a lot of information like this. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, uh, algorithms that is there, it's called routine estimation. So uh, basically what they are doing, they are, every time when you log to Facebook, they are trying to collect information about your location. And then they, those locations start to group. You know, for example, uh, home or job. Or then after job, you're going to pick your kid so on, so on, and then the system is trying to understand uh, those locations and trying to understand anomalies in these locations. And basically, first trying to understand the routine and then trying to understand, for example, if you are flying, then this is anomaly. So from there, uh, they're basically understanding locations that are important in your uh, life and then trying to understand, for example, are you... Uh, a frequent traveler, or you are a commuter, and so on, so on. Uh, another interesting uh, patent is, for example, uh, trying to understand to which social class you belong. So, for example, and this is not just by tracking the, the payments that you are doing, but also trying to understand if you are living in this part of the city, and listening this kind of music, that means that you belong to a certain class. Then uh, there are a lot of different patterns that are re related, for example, with trying to understand how people are using their devices. So for example, if I'm uh, making all the time pictures with my device, if I give my device to someone else, he will uh, he will basically understand that this is still my device. So it, he's trying to locate you, to, to measure you from different angles. So basically this is like one picture, one story. And uh, I will try now to, to explain you how, uh, why we will never, never be able to map completely those black boxes. Here, for example, all of this data that we use, that we can find in the patents, they are two years old, because they don't need to publish this before. So the picture that we can have, it's two years old. So it doesn't give us like real-time map of this uh, uh, empire. On the other side, the the What's going on inside of this box, it's changing on the daily level. But still, I, I think it's important that we try to map those dark uh, places, black boxes, in order to, to have any kind of picture. And for me personally, for example, this map is more like, uh, I'm thinking about it as like some kind of ancient map that is like really wrong with the wrong continents. For example, like America doesn't look so much like this, or Africa looks smaller or bigger, and it's failed, but it's still a map. It can still help us to navigate through this uh, dark woods of, of Facebook uh, empire. So this is one, just one part of the story. Now I will, I will uh, give the stage to my colleague, George who recently investigated more uh, things related to newsfeed and newsfeed algorithms. So he will show you a little bit about that. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, I'll talk just a couple of minutes to present the life cycle of a Facebook content. So in a modern story, we are the product. But in this story, the content produced by us, by the media, by advertisers, is the product. And we have like, uh, this map is just made. It's like a first draft, so it's something we'll work on. It just maps the process. And it has, up there, it has a upload part, where we have content put into the Facebook and different filters applied in order to see what will go through and what will be rejected at the beginning. And then in the middle, we have a news feed manager. We have something what process all the content and compares that with our personal profiles in order to produce the news feed we, we uh, see when we log in into the Facebook. And down there, we have a part which relates to flagging content, removal, um, and different forms of content assessment in an ex post phase. This is ex ante up there. So, uh, just to explain this news feed part. So, practically, we have on the right side the content which is uploaded, which went through the filters, which is fine, and which was uh, ready to be available on a Facebook. And we have like a lot of data about that content produced by different uh, algorithms. On the left side, we have our personal Facebook profile. And we have many different relations to these characteristics of content on the right side. And then, based on these two sets of data and through a prediction algorithm, we will get a ranking score of each individual content in relation to each individual user. And then this ranking score will be compared with ranking score of all other content available for this individual user. And then the newsfeed will be created. But what's the most important question is what is, in fact, this algorithm using data about the Facebook user and data about individual piece of content in order to produce the ranking score. What is this algorithm looking for? And what we can know from the statements of Facebook employees, what we can know from, from other research is that usually is which content is most interesting to the user, what means most likable, most something that he will interact with, place a comment, how long he will watch it. So like matching the perfect piece of content, of course, with the user. And then that could be something like what is usually uh, what Facebook user wants to see, what he believes in, and what he likes to believe in. So then we can start to ask ourselves how these social values transformed into predictions can change each individual newsfeed. And maybe most of us don't want to see the same content we are see seeing all the time on the same line. Maybe we want different content with different arguments, with different uh, value positions. And how can we achieve that? And is Facebook uh, in position to provide us that? And does it have instruments? And can we create different values and different algorithms to create different ranking scores and create, uh, create uh, news feed in accordance with our other ideas? Here, on the other hand, we have, as Vladan explained, all the data which is collected uh, about us as Facebook users from different sources uh, based on different, uh, uh, different actions. And we can really manipulate some of these data. And some of these data are practically something 
what's impossible to manipulate. So there is also a question how much we can influence, even if we want, what will be visible on our face, news feed, uh, if we want to know how to change it. But we usually don't know. So I will stop here, and we can go into discussion to go more on other issues. Thank you very much, um, Vladan and George, to, to uh, your insights on the Facebook machine and on the Facebook methods to measure our identity and to value identity of users and to choose what they will get and what they won't. The following discussion will be hosted by Ben Wagner, who is with Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. Before that, he has been the founder and leader of the Research, Internet and Human Rights section of Europa Universität Viadrina in Frankfurt Oder. Ben, it's your turn and you will introduce your guests, please. Thank you very much. It's, please, take your seats. It's great to see the room being so full, and I apologize if it's not possible for you to sit down. Um, I hope that next time when we have a topic like this, we'll get more chairs in the room. But for now, it's just great to see so many people listening and involved. I just have a quick question, because out of interest, how many people here use Facebook? If you could just put your hands up. OK, that's a, a lot of people. So, Vladan, I was wondering a little bit, you mentioned already that there's a quantification we can make of like the amount of free work that people are doing in the room on Facebook. So I think the room holds normally about, I think around about four or 500 people, and it's over full, so maybe a few hundred more. Yeah. And the minimum wage in Germany is eight euros and 84 cents. We're very precise. So could you give a rough estimate if the Facebook users here in the room have been using Facebook for the last about 30 minutes? Yeah. Roughly how much free work they've done for Facebook in total? I, a lot. I'm not so good in math. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there, there is like, uh, okay, for me when I was doing this, I was like really into uh, this um, context and discourse of like immaterial work and so on and so on. But I had like one even more crazy idea. It's that in this sense, we are not even more, more workers, and it's kind of humanocentric point of view that we think that we are, you know, like workers in this system, but we are not the workers, we are basically raw material. The work, it's not done by humans in this map, it's done mostly by the algorithms. And what humans are doing in this system, they are just producing raw material data. And then algorithmic workforce is transforming this data into the product. And then again on the top, some humans are receiving money for that. Perfect, thanks. I just want to also make you aware that we don't just have Ladan and Georgia here, who are wonderful speakers who've worked on this already from ShareLab, but also Julia Powells, who's currently uh, in the United States and is one of the leading experts on these topics, specifically not just from a, a legal perspective, but also from a sort of public governance and understanding the, the processes around not just what data is being given and how it's being shared, but also the context in which that has effects on certain contexts. So I also just wanted to let you know this is not just going to be a conversation among us. There's so many people in the room that it would be unfair not to let you participate as well. But we're going to have a little bit conversation to get started. We would also ask you if you have any questions, please tweet them at the hashtag or tweet them at me or whoever else you want to on the panel, and we'll try and integrate them as well, just to say that you will be involved. This is not just us talking to you, but we want to talk to you as well and get your questions. And also, I think that it's important to remember that just because the room is full doesn't mean the conversation have to end here, so we'll hopefully keep it going afterwards and there will be many further conversations as well. So having seen all of that, Julia, what do you think can be done about this? What are the next steps that need to be done to ensure that individuals have control over all of that free labor that they're giving to Facebook? Straight to solution. <laughs> I mean, I think I'll just, if I may, just a couple of reflections. Um, it's interesting what you say about labor. I think that it's perhaps 
it, it's true that it's something a bit different to us working. I mean, often, if you're checking, and if you have been checking in the last half hour, that's probably an indication that we sort of, we have a sense of free time that, that's being shackled in some sense. But I think there's also another invisible element of this, um, which is about the energy cost of all of this. I mean, if we're talking about this sort of time, I, I, it's extraordinary to me that we don't sort of, I mean, that, that sort of what, what engine of consumption is there in that element? So perhaps you can, if you've done anything on that, I'd be interested. We, we still didn't, but we, we are working now on that. Basically, this uh, energy consumption and, and material aspect in, in all of this, because all of those like algorithmic maps, they have like also like material aspect of it. For example, the, the main question that we can ask is how much it costs energy-wise to do face recognition, for example. You know? And I always have this idea of like when you are walking on internet, you know, like going tra la la la, checking some website, and then like 30 different trackers in that moment trying to, it's starting to like explode information about your location to like lots of different servers. Okay? And it's starting with really little like energy cost like few bytes, but then going through 20, 100 different servers on the way to like 20 different companies, and then all of those machines that are starting to work like bzz, 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 in order to create the meaning from this little data, it costs like a lot of energy. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, I think, that um, in the optimism about algorithmic mm -hmm. um, tools, we there's an extraordinary inefficiency built in. I mean, I think a lot of the examples around displacement of human labor generally sort of take these examples, oh, won't it be great when we have, I don't know, self-driving trucks or something. But you need to teach a truck uh, 10,000 times, compute each time, and you need to teach a person maybe twice. That's how we, <laughs> we learn how to do things. So I think that, that's another element of the invisible. But just a couple of other reflections. There's, there is this interesting, so getting to solutions, I mean, the point that's often raised is what would it take to make people sort of march with their feet away from... When you see this, I mean, it sort of exposes, I think, the hubris of the... Um, uh, if, if anyone read um, Mark Zuckerberg's sort of epistle to his disciples in this long 3,000-word, very amateur undergrad essay, um, where he con has a conception of infrastructure and community. And what you've exposed with the sort of targeting and the, the cartography of it all is something quite different, I think. But it strikes me that there's something about the invisible even in how we interact at a distance from screens, from machines, and what it would take when it moves more into the physical world. Do you think there's something in... Um, so when you said about the routine mapping, kind of that sense that your world will be more limited in how you're actually interacting, what you're seeing, you know, maybe how you navigate your city or your personal space, and that that would change how we perceive it because it's made more physical? Is there something in just seeing, you know, the way that we look at a distance at updates from our friends that doesn't make us think of all these elements? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm, should I answer? Yeah. <laughs> Please, be my guest. Um, I, I think one of... We, we just had, like, yesterday night some discussion, <laughs> late night discussion, and it was, like, this, that, like, most of the... the, the devices that we use are transforming into uh, basically just interfaces. And there is no machines anymore, they're just interfaces. And the, the, the what's going on, it's somewhere else, on the servers of like Facebook, Google, so on, so on, so on. And this is this like completely, uh, we, we, it's a new level of, of darkness, new level of, 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 of us being like turned from like possessing the devices that we can open, we can like see what's inside and try to do, but going into direction just owning the, the interface, not device anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the scary, um, I think the, the future that is like waiting, because all of those things are going to be even more and more and more complex and our possibility to understand it will be less and less. And I was thinking about, like, for example, if, even if we want to have like algorithmic transparency, trying to understand what's going on, like amount of experts that we will need 
to cover that, that field, it, it, it's just ridiculous. But just to take that up, because we're at the media convention here specifically, and I wanted to bridge that. So if we're just dealing with interfaces, specifically like the one that's already been mentioned here, Facebook's newsfeed, who actually has control of that at the end of the day? Who decides in this interface what can be seen on the Facebook newsfeed? <clears throat> so practically, I think it's clear it's solely uh, Facebook decision at this moment. Uh, Facebook is providing different uh, is opening the system for uh, police and enforcement agencies, maybe for some regulators. On some levels, we'll see how regulation will go, what will that happen with the audiovisual media services directive reform, how it will gonna apply on video platforms, and so, but still, it's solely their decision. And they have all the data, they have both the data about the user and about the content, all data about the content, which is the content which is produced by the media, the valuable data uh, about who saw it for how many time and so on, data which can help uh, overcome the overload and provide better product to consumer are held by Facebook and not by the media production companies who created the data. So do you think it would be better that somebody else than Facebook decides what's on the Facebook newsfeed? Then that really depends from the perspective. If you are coming from a country like uh, in Middle East or in Western Balkans, uh, maybe it's still better to have Facebook deciding, but maybe in some other country with better accountability uh, of institutions in media regulation, uh, from that perspective, we would like more interaction between regulators and private companies doing the distribution. So it sounds like you're talking about making Facebook's newsfeed more accountable. Yeah. Julia, do you want to jump in there as well? Sure. I mean, I think it's interesting how we generally discuss Facebook. And I, it was curious to me that you were speaking originally of factory and then you moved to empire and there's sort of various overtones in that shift. But Often in the um, regulatory space, there's this, um, we use these terms that are very neutral, things like platform, intermediary. And um, I feel like one of the ways in which that's been somewhat abused is it, it removes any responsibility from the platform. You know, you're merely supporting the action. If you're a gatekeeper, you're merely minding the gates. And what is really um, <laughs> apparent from your work is just how much uh, is, is being controlled, I think, here. So one element of um, self-declaration that Facebook's an intermediary, I think, would be a degree to which it's open at both ends. And there's some proposals being um, considered around if, if Facebook is indeed a, an intermediary, could you have something like bring your own algorithm, um, a, a device for um, ensuring that there's an open API, say, on your newsfeed, you may only wish to really follow 50 news sites. Could you insert into um, Facebook's toolkit? I mean, I think that shows some of the invisibilities around how Facebook's operated. One of the reasons it stands lone as a um, major entity is because it has sort of successfully killed off any kind of interoperable um, other platforms. But there are some regulatory pushes towards allowing Just that. Just that I understand that. What you're basically suggesting is to give users or other third parties who aren't Facebook more control over what happens on the news feed that they co-create themselves, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that a, uh, because one of the things that was sort of implicit in your question is a bit this move towards more, um, I think, quite oppressive action, perhaps by the state or other actors that would have more control. And I think as I mean, the, ch the challenge in thinking about companies like Facebook and Google and so on, I'm really glad at this conference we're naming them, um, is to sort of think of alternative futures. And I think one of the ways that we could do that is to take them at their word. If they want to indeed be neutral intermediaries, then it should operate two ways. But then, Lala, just another question. Why do we focus in these debates so much on Facebook? Shouldn't we also look at Google or Spotify or Uber or any of these other companies? Why is the top conversation so much focused on Facebook? Our choice, uh, I'm, it's part of this big five. Yeah? So I think all of them are important to, to, to investigate and to, to discover. There is maybe Facebook is now more in the focus because of uh, the recent uh, 
discussions related to face, uh, fake news and, and, and these um, things, but I think all of them together have a part in, 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 this, in this game. And uh, I think what, what, should, what we should like really address is the, the issue about uh, surveillance economy. That basically it is behind all of this. Because most of those uh, algorithms, those like, you know, th this is the state of the art, what's going on inside of the Facebook, you know? And there is like hundreds and hundreds of brilliant minds working there. But their brain power is used in the direction of like trying to sell you something, you know? So th this is the, 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 the thing that, that that we should address as a problem. It's like the business model of surveillance uh, capitalism that is the main business mo model for Facebook, for Google, for those biggest companies. And so just when we're talking about surveillance capitalism, a quick question for the audience. Could you raise your hand if you use Spotify? Now, could you also raise your hand if you use Facebook? And now just see, OK, that's about half the audience. So based on your Facebook likes or your Spotify public profiles that you cannot turn off, it is possible to say with around 90% accuracy whether you are interested in men or interested in women. That's to say we can run an algorithm across the entire audience and find out who's interested more in men or more in women. And that just gives you a feeling for the, the extent to which surveillance capitalism tells you things about who you are, whether you want to communicate them openly or not. That's not your choice at that point. We can just tell you with a very high statistical likelihood things about yourself, maybe that you didn't even know yet, but you may find out soon. So just to come back to this question of sort of surveillance capitalism more broadly, do you have the feeling, especially from your experience, that there are like strong other actors who are trying to manipulate the Facebook newsfeed? Oh, definitely. Like the, the most important thing about Facebook is uh, getting this different uh, global south perspective. So uh, in other countries, uh, Facebook is the main source of information and main point of contact for all internet users. So, uh, all, practically, people don't use online media anymore. They're just using Facebook in most of the times. Uh, so, Facebook news feed is really critical for creation of public opinion in many countries in the world. So, then, using this prediction, what he gonna like on, what he likes to see, and what he believes in, is making this whole post-truth ecosystem really, really strong. And it's fueling many people who just want to influence creation of public opinion uh, by using these mechanisms and inserting and targeting the news like specific people who want to like that. And that makes the whole process complete. And there is no any quality, uh, quality check. And there is really... Important question we want to ask, do we really want quality check there? Because then it really becomes a mechanism of editorial control. And it's not any more like algorithm going on, it's really something else. And just in the context of like both editorial control and also a little bit of power, do you have the feeling when you look at just at Europe now in a specific European context, and this goes to everybody in the panel, do you think that a large company like Facebook or a large company like Google, let's say, has the ability to change the outcome of elections in a European, company, in a European country, company? I'm almost confusing the two now. No, that's for sure. They, they, they have power. It's just the question, uh, are they going to use that power? Or the mechanisms which are already imposed will be used and manipulated by somebody else? So basically, the power itself is a problem. Do you yeah. agree with that, Julia? There's no further questions, or please jump in. Oh, I just, I, th I thought there was this very interesting point I wanted to pick up about your sense of these being ancient maps and the sort of cartography task. Because I do think we, it feels like we're at a very naive and sort of middle ages moment in thinking about that relationship between our desirable and, you know, very human need to communicate and then this deep, um, pernicious surveillance economy underneath it all. And I think that's what's useful about this sort of visualization. It separates the two. I think 
we, the fact that we subscribe to and we have as many people as we do on Facebook is because we want to talk to our mates. And sort of separating that out and sort of working through what it would take to move from this feudal, I would call it, moment between an empire like Facebook and I think particularly um, useful point about the sort of geopolitics of this and the realities in countries where Facebook is the internet now and it's whole sort of in extraterrestrial infrastructure gambit. But that, that kind of gives a lot of opportunities, I think, for various actions. It's not a single bullet solution, I think. And it's a bit of a danger if we wait until we actually have sort of a, an evil overlord abuser you know, using Facebook, I think the power is sufficient to recognise that it's beyond the power of states at the moment and it requires some sort of response. Yeah, I think uh, so when we were doing this uh, research, so if you Google Facebook algorithm, I think like first 10 pages were like marketing agencies trying to understand how Facebook algorithm is working in order to do their job, no? So, and, and that's the weird thing that, that basically this, that Facebook is not transparent. In some cases, it's maybe not so bad because if a marketing agency know how the algorithm exactly works, they will start to misuse the algorithm to sell you even more things, so on, so on. So there is like different uh, uh, points of view that we can, uh, we can have for this problem. And uh, related to the elections, all of this story about like Cambridge Analytica, and, uh, so they, they are just doing this from the surface, trying to understand how the algorithm works and to extract some information. But what Facebook can do from the inside, that's like, I don't know, 100 times more or 1,000 times more than what Cambridge Analytica can do. That's a pretty clear statement. I'm already getting people waving in the audience, so I think we're going to open it up for questions. And I believe we have some mics going around. Would anybody like to wave if they want to ask a question to our wonderful speakers? No waving. Everybody's embarrassed. Please, over here. Please, that would be fantastic. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the interesting talk and the speech. Um, honestly, to me, it was rather complex, and I think I need to review it uh, on video um, to really make something out of it. Um, but my question now would be, um, what would be your goals or your next steps to bring this topic or create awareness in the uh, public or with pupils or with companies? So what would you recommend how to create awareness of, um, yeah, algorithm? systems and how this may change and the power of it. Do you want to respond? <laughs> Whoever feels comfortable taking the question. Uh, uh, Please. So, uh, me personally, I think I'm um, a bit tired of it. So I think our, my mission in this field is done. Uh, there is like another things that I that I'm attracted to, to, to research and visualize, mostly related to materiality of all of this. But I think within the Share Foundation, we have like, we are trying to tell the story on a lot of different levels. And, and uh, so we have this website called sharelab.rs. And there we are trying to explain the story. For example, like this visualization uh, took me like, few months to do it, but then also like even more time to, to, to tell the story. And this is like really important to try to, to translate these complex issues into, into something that, it, that a lot of different groups of people can understand. And it's really not, not easy. And it's going to be harder and harder in the future because like mm. the, the, the technology is going to be even more complex and even more closed. So, uh, and it's really important to, to do. And of course, like creating this, mapping these data flows enables other professions to add their layer and their perspective and their research. So practically as a lawyer, it's now impossible to apply either human rights standards or business law concepts 
uh, on Facebook, if you don't map the data flow and understand what is really going on on, on data and infrastructure level. So providing these maps really helps others to apply their research uh, and get something out of it. Any more questions in the audience? There's no immediate, oh, please, back here. If you could come to a microphone, I'm sorry, it's hard to see people in the back, so just wave very wide. Get them to come to the mics. Hello, thanks for that interesting talk. Um, my question um, is about the issue of data brokerage, and um, I think you haven't touched on this, but um, Facebook is actually a massive data broker as well, so it uh, has public APIs, interfaces where programmers can develop products where companies can, which companies can use effectively. They're also giving even more access to, to selected partners, it seems. Um, there have been reports in the US but, um, that they also gave data to surveillance companies which, for example, um, surveilled the Ferguson protests um, for uh, different US uh, police departments and stuff. So, um, I'm wondering whether you could comment on that, uh, in what position this brings Facebook with regard to um, uh, law enforcement and, and such public um, 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 actors, but also with regard to the economy that, has kind of, um, that is kind of dependent on Facebook. Um, my impression is that a lot of startups actually rely on Facebook's infrastructure. And they set the terms, they define the terms under which the mm. whole new economy now operates and I think that's a massive problem politically and economically as well. Alan, do you want to respond? Or Julia? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't have the time. We, we, we were aware of, of this uh, aspect uh, of uh, data trading and, and for me what, what was like really interesting is that it's not just this new kind of uh, data dealers like startups and this kind of big data analysis companies but also like old school uh, uh, data dealers like Axiom and others that basically complement Facebook with the different data sets and then they found uh, they're finding like a mutual interest to, to refresh their data sets and basically Facebook is on the top he's sitting on the, the the treasure and everything they do it is basically they control the market by by letting companies doing something or not doing something so making the rules of of, of the game because they have the biggest pile of 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 behavioral data that exists there I think it's really um, useful how you, you put in these various ways that Facebook is symbiotic with a whole bunch of industries and it's very interesting given the context of the media convention. I think that there's an awareness, part of what's so challenging is that as individuals and um, as companies we're often, we're part of the problem effectively. We feed the beast in all of these ways. and I think that the main message really is I th that that's very recent and in many ways I don't think it's one directional. So a, a major move from Facebook to try to co-opt a lot of media companies was this instant articles um, sort of offering and a number of major, um, which was essentially a platform for um, news organisations to have rapid, uh, marginally faster upload of their um, news stories, but the result was they lost complete control. So they put their pages within the Facebook empire and lost any kind of sight of users on their own page or any onward serendipitous discoveries. And yeah, the New York Times and The Guardian just recently have pulled out of that. And I think that sort of a disentanglement, another way in which that's been shown is um, a, a number of advertisers that had realized that they were supporting extremist content on YouTube and so on, withdrew their support via the via Google and I think just sort of there's this whole massive complexity has really stripped us of the kind of raw material being us and then the the sort of empire operator um, and thinking of ways that we can reconnect the ends with with kind of uh, in some way 
disintermediating that middle and the complexity of it, I think, is, is part of the solution. And the different operators, and certainly on the startups who um, use Facebook often as a verification mechanism and so on, they're losing a whole sector. I mean, here in Germany, I think it's 37% of people are on uh, social media. So this massive um, loss, I think, as well as of users. So I, as we're sadly going to have to come to a close now, but there will, the speakers will be available here for further questions. Just to very briefly wrap up, I think the issue that we're talking about mainly is one of power and that the fact that power in and of itself is a problem, both economic and political power. And we shouldn't pretend that it's just enough to say Facebook will never do this or Google or any other large company will never do this. Because the power is there, it will inherently be at some point misused. And knowledge of that and knowledge of that understanding itself is a challenge for freedom of the media, freedom of the press, and also for democracy. Just as one last Please join me in thanking the wonderful speakers we have here for their excellent performance. If you'd like to vote on the panel or tell us how it's done, you have a voting card under your seat. So you can literally take the QR code and tell us how the panel was. And we have one program announcement over here from Benny, I'm told, who would like to make some last statement. Please, the moderator is all yours. Thank you, Ben, for this exciting talk. Thank you all for your interviews and the Facebook machine and in everything which is about influence, which is about um, our dependence or independence from Facebook. Most of you are on their way to stage one. The others who are not, at least, are, should be on their way to stage one. I'm happy to uh, introduce and to announce Frank Pasquale, who's doing his keynote speech in about 10 minutes down there. This is one of the top acts of Media Convention 2017. You are invited, and I'm happy to see you again about 2 o'clock here in this stage, at this stage, to have some deeper insights in the filter bubble, Facebook, and media regulation. Thank you very much. <laughs>